All right. So last time on Tuesday, we'd been talking about Terrence McKenna and true hallucinations and all this crazy shit that Terrence McKenna was doing, including but not limited to the novelty theory. Whoops, which was uh, back here. And the novelty theory was this concept of the world ending basically in 2012. And obviously that didn't happen, or maybe it did, and we're living in the resultant simulation of the explosion of life as we knew it. And then we also talked about the stoned ape theory and how it's an evolutionary theory that has kind of sociological roots in it that has been largely debunked. And then we listened to his voice, his sweet, soothing, loving Terrence McKenna voice. But now I want to move on to Timothy Leary. And Timothy Leary is an extremely, extremely controversial figure in drug history, like possibly one of the most controversial figures, because even though he was extremely important in 2012, um, even though he was extremely important in the process of kind of making the public aware of LSD, etc., cetera, um, he also had extremely controversial practices. Also, I'm sorry that I didn't upload the lecture from Tuesday on YouTube. I've been on the road ever since. So, Timothy Leary is a really unusual figure in drug history because he was actually a Harvard professor and he was, was it Harvard actually? It might have been Stanford. I don't remember. I think it was Harvard. And he was involved in carrying out these experiments on um, students effectively were encouraged to participate in these experiments, but these experiments pertaining to LSD. And this was deeply controversial because he would encourage students to take LSD and he himself would take LSD. And one of the things that he was researching was, was the Concord Prison Experiment, which is basically looking to see if juvenile offenders could have their remission rates lowered by um, taking psychedelics. And the idea behind this was feed them psychedelics and see if they get readmitted to jail. Now, usually 60 something percent of these offenders would become repeat offenders, would have remission rates. But under this experiment, only about 25% ended up back in prison. So this was a really big deal. I think it was Harvard, yes, thank you. Thought so, I just wanna be sure. Um, this was a really big deal because that's a, a really massive reduction in um, remission rates, right? Like that's pretty significant, but a lot of his methods were questioned and people weren't sure of the ethics of it or if it was actually applicable to a broader population. So this was just like, a really, really crazy controversial figure to the point that Richard Nixon declared him to be the most dangerous man in America. And Timothy Leary was also a guy that um, coined the phrase set and setting. Now, as a fun aside that's not on here, I will point out that in, I think, 1967, there was a newspaper in Berkeley, or it was a magazine in Berkeley, California, called the Berkeley Barb that released this extract, this extraction recipe about the supposed chemical contained in bananas called bananadine. And the idea was that you could take 15 pounds of bananas and take the skins of them and then do some kind of extraction with them and stick them in the oven and you would get this fine black powder that could be crushed up and smoked. And this became a, just like a wildfire. This was started as satire because the United States government at that point in time was just starting to get interested in this concept of making illicit drugs illicit. Like LSD was not illegal at this time yet. So as a result of banana dine taking to the streets in terms of word of mouth, like people being like, oh, have you heard that you can smoke banana peels and get high? It's psychoactive. Yeah, mellow yellow, Orion, that's right. Also, in terms of the inmates consenting, um, that's a really good question. I'm actually not sure how consensual these studies are, but generally speaking, inmates consenting to scientific studies is more complicated than just them consenting. It often includes some kind of incentivization towards them and lack of informed consent, which we'll come back to a little bit later when we talk about things like the narco farm. But in any case, so this banana dime thing was just like really wild. It was, there was a song called Mellow Yellow that was released and people thought that that might've been about smoking banana peels or vice versa. And so this became such a widespread fad, basically. Everyone wanted to know if they could really get high off of smoking banana peels. It was said to be like psilocybin in banana peels. So there were hella people that were actually going out and like buying a bunch of banana peels, <laughs> 
trying to smoke them. It was like entirely a satirical article. Um, but what really got interesting about this is that this article was published for a reason. It was published as commentary on the futility of the United States government attempting to regulate drugs. So the commentary was basically, what would the U.S. government do if we discovered that the banana, which is for many people a staple snack, unless they're too brown, in which case you shouldn't be eating them, you should make bread out of them. But this thing that was considered to be a staple snack, right, or just like a casual fruit, what would the U.S. government do if it was suddenly revealed that bananas can get you high? So it was all a statement about this ridiculous shit, and the U.S. government took this bait hook, line, and sinker. Like, the FDA spent about a year researching the psychoactive properties of banana peels, <laughs> and it was a complete wild goose chase. Like, the only reason that they did this was because the Berkeley Barb so effectively planted this seed of, like, this is what the young folks are doing, and the U.S. government just snapped it up and ran with it. So, um... That was, yeah, that was Bananadine. Bananadine is super interesting. You should definitely check it out if you're, if you're curious about it. There, to this day, are people that will try and smoke banana peels. They'll try and do the extraction, do the recipe. But the reason that I bring this up for Timothy Leary is that Timothy Leary credited the CIA with popularizing LSD. And this is just kind of one example of how the government has inadvertently fueled people getting access to an understanding of the fact that certain drugs exist because with something like bananadine the more government agencies were involved in researching it the more popular it became right people were like oh there's validity to this i have to figure it out myself and in the case of lsd the u.s government during mk ultra which is something we'll come back to which was a, a covert cia operation trying basically to um, understand and perfect mind control the cia ended up actually bringing LSD onto college campuses and using it on college students as test subjects. And of course, all the college students were like, this is lit. <laughs> so Timothy Leary was basically the one that was like, the CIA and not any of us are the reason that this became a popularized substance. So that was just a huge aside because Bananadine is so interesting and I haven't been able to talk about it in this class before. So I just wanted to tell you guys that that all happened and it's a very direct equation to LSD. So this phrase, or this, I guess it's a phrase, a series of phrases, tune in, turn on, drop out, I'm sure all of you have heard in some context or another. And this was another thing that was coined by Timothy Leary. And the government at the time, in the late 60s, early 70s, was really invested in this notion that this phrase was trying to encourage America's youth and population in general to stop giving a fuck about anything and stop participating and stop doing anything. But the reality of it was that it was actually supposed to basically be about mindfulness and meditation. Like the whole concept behind tune in, turn on, drop out was tune into yourself, become sensitive to your internal processes and um, become sensitive to things and um, reduce your unconscious commitments and your judgments and your, your obligations. And this became an anthem, obviously. I'm sure we're all familiar with this. So another guy that was really influential in this sphere was Aldous Huxley. And how many of you are familiar with The Doors of Perception by a show of whatever's? A couple of you? A little bit? So The Doors of Perception was a really, really influential book. Like, a really influential book. No, thanks, Diego. <laughs> Um, and this book was released in, I think, the late 50s, early 60s, and it's basically about Aldous Huxley's experience doing mescaline for the first time, and mescaline is the active ingredient in what plants? Name a couple plants that mescaline is found in. Peyote. Peyote. What else? There are a couple more that we've talked about. Mescaline containing cacti. Not ayahuasca. That's a very good guess, though. Ayahuasca is the DMT-containing plant. But the main plant that people know about that contains mescaline is peyote. But then there's also San Pedro cactus and the Peruvian torch cactus and all kinds of other naturally occurring psychoactive plants. So Aldous Huxley did mescaline for the first time. I think 1958. Not positive on that. I think 1958. And as a result of it, his mind was cracked open. He was an author that went into this and wrote The Doors of Perception, 
saying, speak cover art, yes, <laughs> saying basically his experience with mescaline and describing it. And this book was snapped up by the Beatniks, another group of counterculture people that we're going to come back to very, very soon. Um, the Beatniks were basically the, the original hippies following World War II. The Beatniks were the ones that started being anti-establishment. And they snapped up this book about mescaline and they were like, interesting, we like this. So it was actually mescaline that started gaining traction with people well, even before LSD did, in smaller circles, granted. Um, but Aldous Huxley requested to, to die while tripping on acid. So he had his wife inject LSD into his IV while he was dying and described it as a very serene and peaceful death. And um, he was the one that really started talking about this notion of the mind at large. And some of you might be familiar with this in more abstract concepts, but this idea is basically that your mind, as it works, on a daily basis, contains filters, which makes sense, right? Like, if you were able to pick up on all of the sensory information around you 24-7, you would not survive very long because you would get eaten by something, possibly like a friend or family member, who knows? But this idea that your mind has filters in it is really important with psychedelics because the mind at large, it's a theory that psychedelics remove some of those filters. So it's not adding anything. It's merely making you more able to process sensory information that already exists, but your, your brain deems unimportant or not advantageous. Now, inhibit the inhibitors. Exactly. So this is not something that has been like fully backed by science, right? Like there's still a lot we have to understand about this, but it is interesting to think about. Now, Mary Pranks is kind of moving forward in history a little bit, right? We have, um, or we're moving around in history, I guess. So we have Aldous Huxley over with, with mescaline, which is um, from a, a mescaline-containing plant, and he had this crazy experience and started spreading it to people. We have Timothy Leary, who was the Harvard professor that convinced his students to partake in LSD experiments, and it was very controversial, he got fired. And then we have the Merry Pranksters. And the Merry Pranksters were a group of people that effectively started the hippie movement. And the way that they did this was through this bus called Further. And this was known as the magic trick, it, the magic trip. It was West Coast to East Coast, a cross country bus ride where this group of fucking weirdos brought a shitload of acid with them and just distributed it to whoever they met, basically. And this was what really got the ball rolling on this movement. It was literally like a touring acid bus. And here's like a little bit of a, a clip of Cowboy Neil, who was one of the drivers of this bus. I hope this, I'm hot spotted in right now. And it has German subtitles, thank God. Heard of him, I knew of him. He's the main character. Yeah, if you read on the road, he's Dean Moriarty. I don't know if my Zoom is going to allow videos today because I'm on a hot spot. We might have to skip this. But. Yeah, radio, or filling some girl's leg or something. Hundreds of thousands of miles of that kind of driving in his lifetime. A lot of people would never get out of the car away from the same. Yes, yes. Sometimes Mr. Saltine, I'm on our Stephen, is in that same. So that guy was named Neil Cassidy, and Neil Cassidy was the driver of the further bus, and he was one of the people that bridged the relationship between the beatniks and the hippies. He was the one that was driving this bus, and I, I'm not going to try and make this video cooperate, but he would literally get up from the wheel of the bus while the bus was driving. And just like go dick around in the cabin for a while, and people would be like, Neil, 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 get out of the bus. You need to steer it with your hands. But he would just be up and about, like doing something. And this was just kind of the nature of the further bus trip. It was incredibly open and free and quite dangerous in a lot of ways. Um, it was really revolutionary. I wonder if the creators of the Magic School Bus had heard of this. I don't doubt it. <laughs> I don't doubt it. So then there was Jerry Garcia. And Jerry Garcia was. Um, Grateful Dead dude, right? Very famous Grateful Dead boy. Now, in the late 60s, or 65 to 66 more specifically, there were these events called the acid test parties. And some of you might be familiar with the electric Kool-Aid acid test or just the electric Kool-Aid as phrases. And the origin of these phrases came from these parties 
that took place right before LSD was made illegal in 1967, I'm pretty sure was the year. And they would make these crazy collage posters and put them up and invite you to join them on the acid test. And you can see the name Neil Cassidy here, the Merry Pranksters, Neil Cassidy, the Grateful Dead. And this was just the conglomerate of everyone that was just like pushing this movement out the door. And during these acid tests, they were often held in public places and there would literally just be like a massive jug of spiked Kool-Aid that contained LSD. And it was kind of like a massive social experiment. And Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead was one of the people that was involved in these shows. This started melding these cultures, melding these worlds together. I really hope these videos will work today. <laughs> parties up at Keezy's place for Honda every Saturday night. Why don't you guys come? And we said, well, we're working all the time. Luckily, the following week, we got fired. And we had nothing to do. Oh. Rip. I don't know if my bandwidth can handle this. So Saturday night came around. We went to the first one of those parties, which later became the acid test. And what, what did you do there? I mean, it was just experience. All right, I'm not going to try and butcher this, but the, the gist is that they would just like go there and have a party and get high on acid, and it became a social experiment, and sometimes things started going kind of wrong, and then law enforcement got involved, et cetera, and, you know, then acid was criminalized, and, but there was an entire book written about this, the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, which was all about these acid test parties that were just like acid-fueled parties, as you might imagine. Now, in the meantime, there were people pushing back against this, like Mayor Baba, um, who released God in a Pill, which was this pamphlet that was anti-drug propaganda that was like, you can't find divinity in a substance. And so people were indeed definitely pushing back against this emergence of LSD, and it really stratified people right down the middle in a lot of cases. And then 1967 rolls around, and the Summer of Love takes place. And the Summer of Love was just like so many tens of thousands of hippies just flooding to San Francisco hate Ashbury specifically. And this was just like, there were tons of weed everywhere, lots of acid, but San Francisco's not meant to handle 100,000 people flooding its gates to parties. So infrastructure collapsed. And this was actually a pretty big deal because the sewage system was going out, the trash was overflowing, but the roads were clogged. It literally just couldn't handle all of these people, which is kind of what made the Summer of Love shut down. But this whole thing started from a festival called the Human Bean. And actually the banana dime thing that I mentioned earlier really showed its face at the Human Bean where there were tons of people in their 20s that were marching around hold, holding like a giant wooden banana going banana, banana, and like praise the banana and stuff like that. And it was very much intended to throw law enforcement off and be like, look at this trail, but it stuck, it really worked. So this human being was basically in response to the government announcing that it was going to be instituting drug laws. And everyone was like, no, you're not. That's ridiculous. That's not going to happen. Um, I remember my high school chemistry teacher went to UCLA during the Doors height and popularity. And he said he had to take care of some girl who ate snacks laced with LST during one of their shows. That does not surprise me. That sounds about right. So just like a quick little look at the summer of love. Assuming I can get this to work. <laughs> Sorry. We don't have Wi-Fi set up in this new house yet. Sun was shining. People were wonderful. You know, it was like, my God, look at how many there are of us. Most of the country, Ian must have seemed like a world turned upside down. A Harvard professor exhorted the crowd to reject the traditional path of success. Turn on. Larry. Tune in. Drop out of high school, chanting melded with motorcycles and rock music. Such an exciting, heady time to find out that under the official reality, there was this seething. new thoughts, new ideas, new literature, new poetry, new ways of being. The oil of young people was in part due to sheer numbers. Or had so many Americans been under 25? 
are over 90 million of them, nearly half the population. And many were disillusioned with the world around them. Human being was a really, really interesting. So basically, EBC. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, there are some really interesting parallels between them. Now, kind of around this time, oh, you guys, I have to pee so bad. Now, kind of around this time, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas came out, and I'm sure that many of you, how many of you have seen this movie, actually? Whoops, how many of you have seen Fear and Loathing? Not many. Interesting. Okay. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is a classic. It's actually a book. Yeah, yeah, it started out being a book, and then was turned into a movie. And the book actually was kind of revered as being a very different story about drugs than was being generally popularized at the time. Because many things that were being put out about drugs were largely about, oh, they like are going to change your life for the better, and this is really positive, and we need to make them more accessible. And then in the midst of this came out this book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which was actually autobiographical. And it was about the protagonist's own drug use. And it was very, it was just like very unusual, very different because it wasn't very optimistic in the way that others were. The movie is not a complete truthful adaptation of the book, when is it ever? But just to give you an idea of what you're in for if you decide to watch it, if it works. And it's not He's tripping. wakes up in the Flamingo Hotel. This is all I want you to see, please wait. Mm -hmm. What kind of rat bastard psychotic would play that song right now at this moment? That's his hotel room. We never really Why do find control. out what happened. Fully. The general back alley ambience of the suite was so rough. How long have I been lying there? All these signs of violence. What did happen? So, really interesting movie to watch if you're curious. Now, psychedelic rock started emerging at the same time, right? Like, music was being heavily influenced by this, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the classic Beach Boys songs, Wouldn't It Be Nice, as well as all the other Beach Boys songs. But this was another example of a genre. So all of the music that came out as part of psychedelic rock um, thanks, Shark, um, was partially inspired by the use of psychedelics, right? Like the dreamy vocals, the delay, the echoing, the reverberation, all of these things were there for a purpose. That was just a quick mention about that. Now, here's a guy, Owsley Stanley, and, or Stanley Owsley, really. Now, this was the guy who was the main supplier of LSD in the 70s, and he made over 5 million hits of acid. In fact, um, he had a couple of run in with law enforcement, one of which he had 300,000 tabs of acid on him that he claimed were for personal use. It did not hold up in court, needless to say, but he was the guy that got the acid, that made the acid for the Grateful Dead, for the pranksters, for Ken Casey and further. All of these people were supplied by Owsley. So, sound quality coming through from the song is like mid-2000s ringtone. Sorry about that. <laughs> 
So Owsley is a very famous name in the realm of psychedelics, and he was just like a legend with what he created. In fact, I think that he was the one that created um, White Lightning was the first batch of LSD. And then following him was another guy that we'll come back to in a second. And then there's the Grateful Dead, and these were the guys who, of course, were like the cornerstone of psychedelic rock culture. Like deadheads are people that are really into the Grateful Dead. And there were 19 members of the band and affiliates that were arrested in 1970 for drugs. And in case you guys weren't already aware of this, the song Truckin' is actually about that incident. It's about when they got busted in on by cops and um, they were on their way to another show, I believe. Yeah. So Truckin' is about their arrest. And then, of course, of course, the Beatles. But what some of you might not know about the Beatles is that they were actually dosed unconsensually by one of the guy's dentists in 1965. They went over to dinner at the dentist's house who dosed them, and they were like, what the fuck? But also, this is kind of tight. So they actually wrote the song Come Together because they were trying to help Timothy Leary get elected for California governor. And like Come Together right now over me, da, 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 like all of that is specifically about Timothy Leary, who was the leading revolutionary in the psychedelic movement at the time, right? And of course there's the Yellow Submarine, which contains the like classical psychedelic imagery. Oh, is the video quality really bad? Sorry that video that. isn't from the movie. Oh yeah, no, that's not from the movie. That's like a more recent thing. This is the original Yellow Submarine, however. Governor Leary. <laughs> it might have been sweet if it weren't for his incredibly unethical practices and questionable morals. But stuff like this was new. Like people just hadn't really done stuff like this. I don't know if anyone else here was like four and their parents showed them the yellow submarine and they were like, this is really, really uncomfortable. Like, this is like a fever dream. That's how I felt about it. I never understood. So acid becomes illegal, 1967. People are pissed about it. And then two years later, enter Woodstock. And I'm sure that all of you are at least partially familiar with Woodstock, but this was over 400,000 people coming and gathering in one place. And like these signs were commonplace you know you could literally just walk past people that were like acid for one dollar and um i was just reading i've seen anime trippier than this nice burn diego so woodstock was just like again kind of similar to the humans being it did overwhelm the systems that it was part of and at some point i think next next time in the course maybe actually this time we'll talk about the world's worst music festival of all time it's not fire festival. It's worse than that. And not, I bet that none of you have heard of it. So this was like the pinnacle of the counterculture movement. Woodstock was the place that everything culminated. But you can also kind of see that Woodstock was not a perfect animal. It included quite a lot of trash and some theft and fighting. And like, you'll get that anytime you gather people in one place, but it wasn't completely perfect. Um, the Hells Angels security one. Yeah, we'll talk about the Hells Angels as well. Oh, right. So here's the festival I was referring to, the Erie Canal Soda Pop Festival. This was the worst festival in history. So this was across the Erie Canal, right? Um, 200 to 300,000 people showed up, but the, the event planners had only prepared for like 50,000 people to arrive here. So people flooded this thing, and there was like a little bridge that connected the mainland with this island, and it was just completely backed up for miles and miles and miles, like no way in, no way out. They ran out of food and water and ultimately ended up burning down the main stage on the last day. People were just like selling drugs like candy and sleeping on top of each other and no one had shelter. It was complete and total anarchy. If you think Firefest is bad, check out the Erie Canal Soda Pop Festival. Now there's fish. And Fish again, is just like another classically renowned classic rock band. Um, Fishman, this guy, actually used to set his alarm at 5 a.m. to drop acid before school. And um, at 
uh, one concert that they were playing at at Goddard College, the guitarist was tripping so hard that he just like would not play the guitar. He was just like, this guitar is not friendly right now. And everyone was like, can you play the song? We're on stage. And he was like, uh uh, you can't make me do it. So these guys also were renowned for having a crowd that was extremely psychedelically oriented, Fish and the Grateful Dead. Now, for a little dip into something different, um, I'm going to go pee as fast as possible in a second, but there's Sibiant, which is a, a genre of music that was largely popularized by Spangol. And I'll come back after the break because I will literally burst if I don't pee. So I'll just leave you guys with, uh, with some Spangol for a second. I'll be quick, I promise. Okay, nothing happened. I'm back. Anyway, there is that very underwhelming video of Spangle. So, Spangle is a band that became famous for their extremely psychedelic performances, right? Um, father of Psytrance. Yeah, he was not the father of Psytrance. Um, Psytrance originated... OMG, my ears are bleeding. <laughs> was the sound quality really bad? <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Um, okay, then I won't try and play any other Spongel while I'm while I'm here with you guys. Just sounded like screeching. Okay, that's very sad. Yeah, my friend who's out there was like, what the fuck is that noise? Um anyway, so a lot of figures in psychedelic music obviously started out using psychedelics or being in psychedelic environments, and it became kind of a mutually complementary environment there. Um, I'm not going to try and play any more music to resist uh, harming you guys in that way, but this song in particular from Schmungle is actually based off of a farm that Terrence McKenna, the guy that we heard who has the voice like this and talks about the machine elves, has a farm in Hawaii that's called the Botanical Dimensions, which is about cultivating indigenous plants and researching plants. So that's part of what the song was named after, actually. So there's a lot of um, commingling here. Um, are you using shared computer sound using the speakers? Um, using the speakers, usually I have actual speakers, but since I'm on a barren mattress in a house with no furniture, I don't right now. But next week I will. I'll have that back. So then there are artists like Tipper. Again, I will not play these for you right now. <laughs> next time. And Tipper is more ambient, but again, falls into this category of um, music that is intended to complement a psychedelic experience, or at least was made with a psychedelic experience in mind. So here's just like an example visually of a set that Tipper might play. And um, again, these are like oftentimes catered at least partially to the experiences of people that are on psychedelics that are at these shows. If you get the chance to go see Tipper, do it. Hit or miss recently, but I, I like Tipper, generally speaking. 
And then there's Android Jones. And artists like Android Jones are renowned for, again, being extremely psychedelic. He is known as a, or he's what's known as a visionary artist, which is basically an artist who tries to convey complex internal states, um, altered states of consciousness or visions that are had through psychedelics, etc., in a visual context. And Android Jones actually does IMAX domes at certain uh, events and shows, etc., where you can lie down in this IMAX dome and have a full 4D experience, not 4D experience, a full 3D experience with Android Jones' original art, which is really remarkable. It's called Samskara. Um, and it's absolutely well worth it if you get the chance to. Android Jones and other artists, um, visionary artists in particular, often dedicate their work to trying to visually convey the experience of psychedelics or altered states of consciousness, which can be really difficult to do verbally and also are very difficult to do visually. You know, like there's a lot of fractal components, there's a lot of warping, a lot of moving. Um, so this is an example of art by Android Jones. Um, then there's Alexander Gray, who is another really famous psychedelic artist. I'm sure that many of you have seen this one on the left at some point in time, trying to represent this kind of tunneling, fractaling, like morphing, if you zoom in on these things, then you might start to see the same image reflected in slightly different ways over and over again, which is a very common experience while tripping on psychedelics. And there's Psytrance, which I'm not going to play here because of uh, sound, but it all sounds uh, relatively similar, but the same could be argued for most genres of electronic music, so I'm not going to make that argument. So Psytrance, yeah, I see some dissent <laughs> happening. Psytrance is um, very popular, especially in like regions of South Africa. And uh, I think South America is pretty big on Psytrance as well. North America has some Psytrance communities, but it's not quite as big as it would be in, in regions like South Africa and um, New Zealand and Australia. And it is a trance-oriented thing. It's like a dun -dun 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 like think horse hoofs, but crazy. Um, Israel too, yes, yes, exactly. So just taking a quick look at the more culty behaviors related to psychedelics. We're not gonna delve too far into this, but we can get kind of a quick overview. So the Brotherhood of Eternal Love was a group that in the 60s wanted to create a utopia. And because of this, they decided that they were going to do so by making a shitload of LSD and giving it away, oftentimes for free. So we had prior um, Owsley, Stanley Owsley, who was making a shitload of LSD. And then another person that came kind of after slash under him was Tim Scully. So Owsley was making white lightning, Tim Scully was making orange sunshine. And this differentiation is something that people still kind of use to this day. LSD 25 is LSD 25, that's his full chemical name. Um, sometimes the way that it's made, the environment that it's made in can influence the way that it feels, but we don't really fully understand the validity of that or how concrete that is as a measurement. But um, in 1972, the Brotherhood, Brotherhood of Eternal Love faced some serious hot water and in the meantime was also helping Timothy Leary escape from prison in the United States to get to Algeria. <laughs> and this was a $25,000 deal that they made. So the whole concept behind the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, or one of the major concepts, was we're going to make a shitload of acid so that it's free for everyone, so that everyone can reach this kind of like openness and enlightenment and love. So they made 100 million hits of it, <laughs> or somewhere in that ballpark. At least they tried to. That's a lot of LSD. I just want to make that very clear. So the idea was to kind of dilute the market. Then there was the family. And the family is a more culty cult. The other, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love had cult elements to it, but not so much centralized leadership. So the family was a cult that involved 28 kids that were abduct, abducted or adopted by a single mother figure. And from a young age, they were kept in isolation and given psychedelics like LSD in an effort to kind of like break and mold them. Um, this started at the age of 15 and it was kind of this idea of like you need to break through your mental blocks you need to figure your shit out um turns out this doesn't work as well as people might think to no one's surprise whatsoever is that terrible sounding I'm looking right at each one of you you are the initiate 
You are the cosmic being. Under the influence of LSD, Wai Jian had this vision that she's got to collect all these children from Earth. One day there's going to be World War Three. She was preparing us for when the time happens to re-educate the world. We've received the call. It's a great thing to be done. I'm wondering if you've got any comment to make now about what happened to the children. The investigation is still underway for a religious sect in Victoria known as the family of the week that six children were seized from a property the second was made up of as Jesus Christ reincarnated in the female form. This woman had phenomenal presence. She's strong, she's powerful. Intrinsic, beautiful. The eyes that look through your soul. The FBI agent ran and said, we've got the bitch. 28 young people went through our hands. Why did you do that? I love children. watch this documentary but I haven't had time to but this is just one example of how um, those in positions of power have historically attempted to utilize the potentially very vulnerability inducing properties of substances like psychedelics specifically LSD and we'll come back to that more um, in a couple of lectures but for now because I wasn't uh, prepared to hit the day some outdated dates on it it's not actually november 4th i'm on the road i'm sorry um we'll take a quick immediate look into counterculture as a whole in terms of counterculture communities that have been involved in drugs but before we do that what are two natural sources of 5-meo dmt two places you can find 5-meo dmt not dmt 5-meo toads toads that's right el bufo the Bozy frog. You're so close. It's the Bufo toad. <laughs> and the Bozy frog is so funny. That, but like, you're so close. <laughs> this is like a very me thing to say. Okay, so the Bufo toad. And then what else? I'm thinking of one other substance. And I'll come back to your question about 5-MeO versus DMT in a second, Sharp. Or I'm thinking of one other um, natural source of 5-MeO DMT. Does anyone remember what it is? Give you a hint this one is a plant anything you remember about it what it looks like what form it comes in might not You're talking about ayahuasca or a different one not talking about ayahuasca ayahuasca contains dmt okay. i'm talking about yopo and yopo is a kind of um seed or it's a tree seed you know seed pods that contain seeds in south america and the seeds contain both 5-MeO-DMT and DMT. And these were typically ground up and then snorted. So to answer Shark's question about the difference between 5-MeO-DMT and DMT, they're, they're not directly comparable only because 5-MeO-DMT is so profoundly powerful. And DMT is also profoundly powerful. Don't get me wrong, DMT is one of the most intense psychedelic experiences that the human brain can go through. 5-MeO-DMT, as I said last time, is a substance where someone who I know who has been in this field for decades has said that he would only administer to someone with six months of being able to sit with them beforehand. So it is important to note that while 5-MeO-DMT and DMT do share similar properties like smoking them and them lasting for like 10, 15 minutes and 
other similar things about how you can blast off and meet entities and deities and how time can stretch into the infinite and condense into a pinprick, etc. 5-MeO DMT is vastly more powerful than DMT, which is really saying something. So on a chemical basis, I would be lying to you if I told you that I knew the most up-to-date understanding of the difference between them pharmacology-wise. I would definitely look into that if you send me an email and remind me. I've been very slow about answering everyone right now. I have some backlogged questions. I'm sorry if I haven't gotten around to yours. I have been traveling for days, um, traveling safely, mind you, double masking. Hmm. Stay at home. But I also would advise that 5-MeO-DMT is, um, it's, it's simply used in a different context. DMT is often used in more recreational environments, which personally speaking, I think is maybe not the wisest choice. 5-MeO-DMT, um, you do not bring to a party. You just don't. Like when I was at Spongel last year, there was a dude in the, in the amphitheater next to us who had a DMT vape and he was just chiefing on it and like getting bubbly and like rolling around in the stands and like offering it to everyone he saw. And you can do that with DMT to an extent. You can get like a little bit of a high off of it and like not fully blast off. But five is not treated in the same way. So a lot of it's cultural, I would say. So we have El Bufo and the Yopo seeds. Um, and just because you probably don't remember this, I'll tell you that um, indigenous populations would often ingest yopo through um, certain kinds of ceremonial snorting pipes. In the Caribbean, it's called a cahoba, and it's a two-pronged snorting pipe, or you can blow it in someone else's nose, which is a much more efficient way of um, ingesting it if you don't have the ability to like, like snort it, like blowing it in someone's nose is a lot more forceful. Which person was the godfather of psychedelics? The main guy that wrote P Call and T Call. Alexander Shulgin. That's right, Alexander Shulgin, the guy with the bike. <laughs> the guy with the bike was um, Albert Hoffman, who was the first guy to synthesize LSD, but everyone's name seems to start with an A, so it's a very understandable mix up. So we have Alexander Shulgin, otherwise known as just Shulgin who, um, alongside his wife, Anne, who was also a really prominent contributor to this, created um, basically an encyclopedia for different psychedelics and psychoactive drugs, and also synthesized hundreds of new ones and tested them on themselves at different dosages and reported back, which is crazy. Albert Hoffman um, synthesized LSD and then five years later revisited it on purpose, and that was Bicycle Day. So Albert Hoffman, bicycle guy, LSD inventor. Alexander Shulgin, godfather of psychedelics, overall really interested in psychedelics in general, came after Hoffman. Aldous Huxley, eight mescaline, wrote The Doors of Perception, kind of bridged a couple of, of uh, different subgroups of psychedelic people. Um, and that's on the list of activities to do next time, that and bring paint and colored pencils. <laughs> yeah, good luck actually painting on psychedelics. What event was effectively the culmination of 60s counterculture? This is an easy one. Oh my God, you guys, come on. Woodstock. Thank you, Woodstock. Those three Woodstocks, I'm satisfied. Who was the Grateful Dead's acid dealer? I'll give you a hint, his name has a bird-like word in it. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Owsley, yes, that's right. Um, also, in response to your comment, Danita, about not really knowing what Woodstock is, that's fine. It basically was a huge music festival that gathered people from all over the, the country, and in some cases the world, I'd imagine, and became like a pinnacle of counterculture and had speakers about like freeing yourself and a lot of drugs, and it was basically like a whole bunch of people saying, fuck you, fuck it, in one place, and listening to music. In what country do giant honeybees produce hallucinogenic honey? There are two countries here. Giant honeybees, they're in mountains. Nepal, yes, exactly, that's right. One of them is Nepal. <laughs> the other is what? <laughs> Oh, 
please. I'm making the noise for you. Turkey. Guys. Turkey, thank you. Nepal and Turkey, two countries where there are huge honeybees that feed off of um, rhododendron plant rhododendron plants that produce cryonotoxin in their honey. So it's a honey that kind of gets you stoned. Whoops. Yeah, that was a turkey noise. I'm sorry it wasn't a good turkey noise. <laughs> That's my claim to fame. Anyway, there's Datura, which is the deliriant, intoxicating plant that is often grown by your house. Please don't pick and sniff these flowers. You could get high. Anyone remember what this is? Looks like rosemary, but it's not. It's psychoactive. Salvia, yes, Karina, you are killing it. And then anyone remember what this is? It's a smokable DMT blend. Bonus points if you can tell me what it's blended with, what it's called, smokable DMT blend, and what it's blended with. All I remember is it's an MAOI, I think. Yes, exactly, there's an MAOI. And what other um, combo drug contains DMT and an MAOI? Um, ayahuasca. Exactly, yes. So Changa, this is called Changa, is the smokable version of ayahuasca, basically, that was created only about a decade ago by some very intuitive wooks that really wanted to do ayahuasca without, you know, drinking it and brewing it. Now, I'm tempted to not get into this too much today, but I think I probably should because I'm going real slow in this course right now. I'm sorry. Um, but we should talk a little bit about, or we should we should get started on this. So we're going to start in the 1930s when we talk about counterculture because the word counterculture has so many tendrils and so many different things and it's really important to recognize that when we talk about drugs and counterculture we're specifically talking about countercultural movements that have been molded or influenced by drugs this is not exhaustive there are tons of counterculture movements that are not related to drugs at all but because of the nature of counterculture, a lot of counterculture movements have been molded by drugs. And one of them was actually jazz. And jazz just went crazy in the 30s. And like Charlie Parker and um, Rollins and Baker were all major names in jazz, right? But little do many people know that heroin was actually a really major part of jazz community. <laughs> heroin and weed and alcohol and from the combined efforts of these things I don't know how well you can hear me so I'm not going to go too hard on that from the combined efforts of these things we have lost about 400 years of jazz due to deaths from overdose and fatty liver cirrhosis of the liver is fatty liver from alcohol we've lost 400 something years of jazz from this because this genre was so plagued with um, heartache and hardship and we might not know this right off the top of our heads, right? That, that jazz and heroin were like peanut butter and jelly at that point in time. And there are so many reasons why this was the case. Like many um, jazz musicians were black Americans. And obviously with that time period, being a black American included massive racial injustice and massive poverty and hardship because of systemic inequity and, and racism. And so all of these factors kind of contributed to this overall feeling of jazz being deeply underground. Like jazz as an art was very, very entrenched in communities that were struggling for one reason or another, almost entirely systemic, right? Now from there, we started seeing this new thing that happened where the first ever the film Ray mentions his addiction to heroin a lot. Yes, yeah. Um, this is actually a really, really major problem that people just don't really know about. But the things actually started to take kind of an unexpected turn here because the first actual addiction research center opened up. Actually, that comes a little bit later. Ignore me. So in the 30s, these issues with jazz were happening. And kind of in response to this, there was a prison that became known as the Narco Farm that was an experimental addiction treatment slash um, incarceration center, basically, where you would go there and it was the first place where they were actually studying addiction as being a disease. 
And you could basically choose either I would like to be incarcerated at a regular prison or I would like to go to the narco farm. But the unexpected uh, result of this was that the narco farm had an incredible jazz band, an incredible jazz band, to the point that people actually wanted to get arrested so that they could go and play jazz with the greatest jazz musicians of all time in this basically experimental research center prison where the idea was we'll give people with substance use disorders um, farming land and they'll farm and that will be the answer. And while it sounds like, it might sound like I'm about to say, and it was, and it worked perfectly, it did not work perfectly. But part of the reason for that, if not the entire reason for that, is that if you put someone from a horrific and hard environment into a new environment, to rehabilitate them, and then you release them into the exact same environment they came from, of course they're going to relapse. Of course they're going to face the same problems over and over again. So this just was not a super successful endeavor, but it was true that a lot of people really wanted to go here so that they could play in this legendary jazz band. Then we move forward to the 70s, and the Addiction Research Center cropped up. And this was shortly after MK Ultra and all kinds of scandal with government control and mind control, etc. And this was one of the major examples of how the US government was directly exploiting people that were addicted to substances or had problematic substance use by very literally saying, if you participate in this study, we will give you heroin. And this was supposed to be a treatment center, right? Like this was supposed to be an experimental treatment center but they would intentionally re-addict or, or create dependencies again for people so that they could withdraw them and try new experimental treatments on them. If you go to drugabuse.gov and look up the Addiction Research Center, this is not mentioned on the website. The fact that this was a huge scandal that got shut down because it was discovered that the doctors were actually very intentionally um, worsening or reiterating people's existing addictions and dependencies. It's just not mentioned. It's funny, right? And then last thing that I'll mention today is the beat generation. This was 1950s to 1960s, and this was after World War II when people were angry. And they got this out of their systems by playing bongos and saying poetry, which I'm not slamming. It just is like, it is funny that it ended up being that form. But the beats were the people after World War II who got fed up and it ended up looking a little something like this a lot of the time and this is mainly in, in, in uh, Greenwich Village in New York City so it was a lot of slam poetry and this was kind of like literature about sex and drugs and like queerness started finally rising to the surface. It was like the dam broke. The people were angry. They were tired of experiencing this kind of subjugation. They were tired of not being hedonistic. And this term hedonism of the pursuit of pleasure became popularized during this time as well. And bebop came around and this was all just rejecting traditional ideologies. The next time on Tuesday, we will come back and we will talk a little bit more about what that looks like. And I'll be at an actual desk again. Thanks for sticking with the technical difficulties this time, Talia, you can stop recording. I will get both of these recent classes up as soon as possible because I know that I have not gotten the one up from Tuesday yet. <laughs> Sorry about that. But um, thank you guys and have, oh yeah, this is my monkey. His name is Monkey, M-U-N-K-E-E. -E. He's my kid. Have a great night, you guys. Thanks for popping my drugs again.